This morning as we worshiped, I was reminded of a, a story I heard one time. This uh, uh, young minister comes to a church, a small church, for the, for the first time, and uh, he gets up for his first sermon, and, and he preaches it, and it is just, it is a great sermon. It just hits on all the points, and everybody in the congregation is so excited because they're like, we got this new young minister, and boy, can he really preach. We are so excited about this. And so uh, then they all go home, and they go throughout their week, and they come back the next Sunday. And he gets up to preach, and they're all excited, and he preaches the exact same sermon. And they all go, okay, well, he's new. Maybe he just, you know, it's busy. He's learning a lot of new names. Maybe just something happened there. So they go throughout the next week, and they come back the third Sunday, and he preaches the exact same sermon. And then they start to grumble. And then they start having those, like, side conversations in the parking lot, you know, like after church, where the real business happens. And... Um, and so then the, the fourth Sunday, he comes back, and he preaches the same sermon again. And so a couple of the deacons come up afterwards, and they're like, Reverend, Pastor, what's going on? Why, why do you keep doing the same sermon over and over? And the new pastor looked at them and said, well, once you guys start doing what I talked about, then we'll move on to the next one. <laughs> I bring that up, and I was reminded of that, because last week we talked about uh, this idea of, a, a, as Christians and as a church, uh, our identity being found in Christ. And not about what, we, uh, what generations uh, we come from or what political preferences we have or, or the preferences and the things we like. Uh, that our identity becomes Christ first and foremost. And we talked about what that looks like in a church, especially in an intergenerational church, is that it looks like different groups, disparate groups with different likes and preferences and dislikes and all that coming together under the identity of Christ. And the, the reason that I thought of that this morning is because you guys have come together this morning uh, in, in, in a worship style, in a worship situation, blending things together that is not uh, your typical way of doing things. I know that there are people in here that probably uh, heard the music this morning and they're like, oh, that's a bit much for me. And then other people during the, particularly the, the more traditional hymns that happen, they're like, you know, I, that's, that's really not my thing. But friends, last week we talked about our identity being in Christ first and foremost. And you all this week lived out an example of that this morning. And that's exciting. And I'm going to ignore the fact that I saw emails about this for months talking about how, how this was planned beforehand. I'm just going to say, good job listening to the sermon last week. <laughs> And because of that, I'm going to preach a different sermon this week. <laughs> well, we left Denton, Texas the day before. And most of the daylight hours were spent uh, watching the barren land of West Texas go by, interrupted by an occasional oil derrick. Sometime in the middle of the night, we stopped at a gas station in Phoenix. And to this day, if anyone mentions Phoenix to me, all I can picture is the hazy orange light that deserted Exxon parking lot. We kept pushing on, taking turns driving, keeping the driver awake and trying to doze off a little in the back seat of the minivan. Every time we'd stop for a break, we'd open the door and in would rush the, the colder, crisper air of higher altitudes and replace the stale air of four unshowered guys in a minivan. By the time we pulled into the visitor parking lot that morning, we had we'd reached the point where our exhaustion had turned into punchy antics and constant chatter. We must have been a very noisy and annoying bunch as we made our way up the trail to, from the visitor center. But when we reached the south rim of the Grand Canyon, all of the nervous energy, all of the excited chatter, all of the rough housing and horse place stopped as we looked at the site that was laid out before our eyes. I don't know if you've ever visited the Grand Canyon before, but if you've seen it, I'm sure you would agree that it takes your breath away. Your eyes are overwhelmed by just how big everything is. You look down into that gorge that has been cut away over millions of years, and you get dizzy imagining yourself falling from the extreme height of the rim. I had a, a new camera that day. It was one of the first ones that were able to take uh, panoramic pictures. But when I got home and I got the film developed, you used to have to do that. 
I got home and I got it developed and I looked at the pictures, it, it, it made me sad at how little of the glory and grandeur of the scene that it captured. For a moment there, our senses were overwhelmed. Our voices got quiet, almost reverent. We were in awe as we tried to take it all in. And you could almost describe that moment as holy. But nature's glory is not only revealed in grand sights and faraway places. That sense of awe and holiness can be found as near as the wooded area behind the house. In her book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, Annie Dillard spends time meditating on the beauty of nature that she sees around her home beside a creek just outside of Roanoke, Virginia. In the book, she describes a year in the surrounding landscape of looking closely and moving slowly and listening attentively. Someone said of Dillard's work that she describes what no one else has noticed with quite the same acuity. A mockingbird's free fall descent from a four-story building. A shearwater's bank shot plunge into a nest on a cliff. The texture of onrushing shadow in a solar eclipse. Dillard helps the reader slow down, look closer and breathe deeper as we stride through the natural world. And she says such experiences can be less like seeing than being for the first time seen, knocked breathless by a powerful glance. The farmer and poet Wendell Berry can go even smaller. As he sits under a tree in a clearing in the woods, he contemplates a single leaf falling to the ground. And in that moment, he can see the whole cycle of life, from birth to growth, to returning to the ground in death, but following that death, new life being born out of the ground. And I'm sure that you can think of a moment in your life when the glory of God's creation moved you deeply, when something is as grand as a mountain view or a giant redwood tree or the crashing thunder of a powerful storm left you with a great sense of God's glory and grandeur. But maybe it is a simpler place or a more routine activity uh, that, that brings you or moves you to reverence. For some of you, it might be fishing in a quiet cove. For some, it might be digging in the soil of your garden. For some of you, you might get a sense of reverence for God while hiking on a local trail or maybe simply just an early morning walk in your neighborhood. I'm sure that many of you here feel that way, listening to the rhythmic ocean waves crashing against the beach. In fact, the summer worship attendance at many churches testifies to the popularity of those holy moments on the beach. In Psalm 104, the author is taking us on a guided tour of creation. He wants to show us all these things so that, that, might, that they might testify to the glory of God. We didn't read from the beginning of the psalm, but it begins saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord, you are very great. And then the tour begins in God's presence, clothed in honor and wrapped in light. And from there we fly through the heavens, marveling at the clouds and the winds. And then we move to the solid foundations of the earth, and we see the waters of the primordial chaos retreat, revealing high mountains and fertile valleys. And wild animals drink from the springs that God provides them, and we marvel at the balance and the abundance of nature. And then closer to home on our tour, we see the domesticated animals and the regular crops which bring life and health to humanity. We see the trees where the birds make their nest, and we watch as all of creation lives within the ordered rhythm of day and night, working and resting as is their nature. And at that point, the psalmist cries out and prays, How manifold, how many are your works? In his message translation, Eugene Peterson renders the lines, What a wildly wonderful world, God. You made it all. With wisdom at your side, made earth overflow with your wonderful creation. And while many of us have experienced the majesty of God in, in moments like these, it often takes our poets and our songwriters to put that praise into words. Stuart Hine wrote the word, but you probably know that George Beverly Shea made them famous. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, and all that song leads us to praise as we sing to God in response to what we see, how great thou art, how great thou art. Or what about another hymn writer who looks around and sings, This is my father's world, 
And he looks to the rocks and trees and skies and seas and sees the imprint of God's work there. It's the same thing as the psalmist saying, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. And then the psalm continues, which is what we heard in our reading. And it doesn't seem like there's anywhere else for us to go on this tour of creation. But the psalmist wants to take us further. He says, yonder is the sea, great and wide, creeping things, innumerable are there, living things, both great and small. Now, it may seem a little anticlimactic that we get to the ocean or the sea, but that's because we are water people around here. For those of us here in the 757, water is just a daily fact of life. We're surrounded by it. We depend on it. It affects us in many ways from the ships that we build at work to the traffic that we sit in because we have to go through a tunnel. My wife grew up in the valley in Harrisonburg, and, and then when we moved to this area almost 10 years ago, the, the two things that took her longest to get used to, first of all, was how flat everything was, but secondly, was how much water was all around. But the people of Israel, they were hill people. They were not seagoing people. In fact, for them, the sea or the ocean, it didn't represent commerce or travel or sustenance, for them, the ocean or the sea symbolized chaos and danger. The sea was the outer limits of things. It was beyond control. It was a place of great risk. It was a place of disorder and untamed power. But even out there, out beyond everything known, out there in the great and terrible unknown, God is in control there as well. The psalmist pictures that terrible ocean as a place with ships going back and forth in an orderly fashion. And then the Leviathan, that terrible sea monster of the deep, it describes him like a tamed pet who sports or plays or frolics all around in it. Even in the most chaotic place imaginable, the psalmist says, God is still in control. And the first lesson for us in this the first thing that the psalmist is teaching us is about the mighty power of God. The psalmist looks at the enormity of creation and says, God is bigger than that. He looks all around and said, God rules all of that. He looks at things that are even scary like the Leviathan, the sea monster, uh, things that are uncontrollable like the sea and says, even in those places, God reigns. What a lesson for God's people in turbulent times. Friends, in times of trouble, we need to remember this truth. There's an old British propaganda poster from the beginning days of World War II. This poster was not very well known in its time, but it was rediscovered in the year 2000. And you've probably seen it because it's kind of taken a life of its own on the internet. And the poster simply says to Londoners who are uh, anxious about the Blitz, it says, keep calm and carry on. Our psalm tells people in a way, keep calm and carry on. Now, it doesn't mean to be in denial about things about the world. It doesn't say be ignorant of hardship or suffering. Don't pretend that things are all right when they are not. But keep calm and carry on because this is the God that we worship and serve. His power is greater than anything in all creation. He made it all. It all serves him. His power is even greater than the chaos and danger of the sea. The psalmist says that God is there and in control of that as well. How much more then should that power be enough for our lives? Are we able to keep calm and carry on no matter what the world throws at us? Because we trust that our God is in control. It should give us peace to know that the God who is over the seemingly uncontrollable sea is also over the things in our lives that seem out of control. It's true of something as big as our creation, but it's also as true of our lives as well. We used to sing a song when I was a young life leader, and the lyrics went, What if what they say is true? What if you calm the sea? Can you calm me? And the witness of the scriptures is yes. God can come and bring order in our lives like he brings order into the created world. God can come and give us something solid to base our life on, just like he sets the earth on its foundations. That hymn that I mentioned earlier says it well, This is my Father's world, and let me ne'er forget 
that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. But God's power is not just about some distant order far away. While one of the lessons of the psalm is about God's power, Another lesson of this psalm, and it's a very appropriate one as we lead up to the Thanksgiving holiday, another lesson of this psalm is about God's provision. Speaking of the creatures of God's world, the psalmist writes, These all look to you to give them food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. Now it's one thing for us to trust in God's power. It's a whole other thing altogether to trust in God's provision. Friends, we do not trust in God's provision. Now, it's not totally our fault. Our culture tells us that we have to work and strive and struggle for what we need. Our culture also tells us that when we get something, we've got to to hoard it away. We've got to hold tightly onto it because one day there might not be enough left. And so we sullenly strive when we should rejoice and be thankful that God has given us enough. Or maybe we hoard and hold on to things when God might be asking us to be a vessel through which he provides to someone else. And the scriptures are full of examples of people who trusted in God, who waited on God, who moved when God called them to because they trusted that he would provide what they needed for the journey. I think about the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness, always just one step away from running back to slavery in Egypt because they said at least we had the fish and cucumbers and melons and leeks to eat while we were in Egypt. But while they journey, God provides for them manna from heaven, enough to last a day at a time. It is literally daily bread, and it is enough to sustain their journey to the promised land. The psalmist wants us to remember to trust in God's provision. Later on, Jesus reiterates that message when he tells his followers, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food? Is not the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But strive first. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. And I find it so interesting that just like the psalmist, Jesus looks to God's creation when he teaches this message as well. So we can trust in God's power. And we can trust in God's provision. How then can we respond as God's people? The psalmist writes, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. And so our simple response as God's people is praise. The people of Israel were supposed to be always telling the story of what God had done for them. They were to tell it in their worship in their festivals, in their lifestyle choices, and in their economic arrangements. The whole idea was that when the the surrounding nations, when they saw the praise of Israel, when they saw the lies of Israel, that they could look beyond those things and they could see the God that Israel served. When we as God's people today praise him with our lips and with our lives, it is an opportunity to share with others who God is and what he has done for us. The psalmist also says, may my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. We need to be mindful daily of the power and the provision of God. The prophets were always accusing Israel of uh, when she strayed from God. They were always saying, you have forgotten your God. And meditating on, being mindful of God and his power and provision, it will help keep us focused. It will help us from straying and getting distracted, and all of a sudden feeling like things are chaotic and things are out of control all around us. Meditating daily on God's power and provision 
can help us keep calm and carry on, for we will remember where our strength comes from, and we will remember who will take care of us in all things. I think one last thing this psalm can teach us, and it's a, it's a very simple thing. Maybe we need to get outside more. Maybe we need to find ourselves lost in the glory of God's creation, for it is a reminder, just like it is in the psalm, of just who it is we worship and serve. And maybe we can't get all the way out to the Grand Canyon, but maybe like the Annie Dillards and the Wendell Berries of the world, we can slow down and look closely and pay attention to the wonderful power and provision that are present in God's creation all around us. Let us pray.